Let us pray. Almighty God, silence within us. Any voice but your own that we might hear your word anew for us this morning. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears to hear and believe and live. Guide us. Guide us by your word and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I actually asked to do the scripture readings. Uh, ordinarily we have someone else do the readings, but uh, every once in a while I like actually to do it. And uh, our first lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, which can be found beginning on page 1068. Here Jesus tells a story, a parable, to teach us a lesson about life. And this parable is of the Pharisee uh, and the tax collector. Jesus said, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down upon everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, which can be found in your pew Bible on page 987, if you wish to follow along. Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own, own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're finishing up this morning this series that we've been going through the month of August on half-truths. These are things that we hear and say that uh, have some scriptural basis. You can point to uh, various scripture verses uh, to support these uh, half-truths. But maybe we need to step back and evaluate them and examine them and ask, is this the whole truth or is it the best truth? We've gone through several of these that we may have heard or said or may even believe. And like I said, there's scriptural, uh, scriptural backing to support them. But this morning, we've come to the last one that, honestly, I had wanted to skip. Believe it or not, there are actually sermons that I stand up here and don't want to preach. Now, you might think that, well, you knew that Becoming a preacher would mean that you would have to preach messages and that you would stand up from the pulpit week after week and share things. But sometimes there are things that we don't want to, well, talk about. And this last half-truth is one that, well, quite frankly, falls into that category. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Has anyone not heard this? Yeah, I think everybody probably has from one time or another. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Now, there is a grain of truth in here. We are all sinners. I think that we could agree upon. And we should love one another, sinners alike. And there is multiple scripture verses, uh, especially in the Old Testament, that refer to God's hatred of sin. In fact, Paul talks about sin and evil, that we should flee from it. Sin is not good. It is not something that we should be cozy up to. But there is the relationship between these two things that becomes a little bit murky. Love the sinner, hate the sin. I can tell you that, uh, at least in my limited experience, that Jesus never says, love the sinner. He doesn't say it. He demonstrates it all over the place. Think of the adulterous woman who is brought before him. Never mind the man, because it takes two to commit adultery. But it was the woman who was brought before him. And we all know how the story goes. The law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. And several people who are conspiring to catch Jesus have brought her to him in front of everybody. We assume they've got their stones in hand, ready to take care of justice. And what does he say? Let the one of you who is without sin 
cast the first stone. He doesn't in this moment make her all about sin as those who have dragged her there do. He turns the mirror back on the crowd and says, the perfect one, you who have no sin, you cast the first stone. Again and again and again, Jesus meets up with people who are sinners, who are broken. Think of the woman at the well. How many husbands has she had? And the one she's living with now is not her husband. And yet she has this amazing life encounter, life-changing encounter with the one who offers her water gushing up to eternal life. When Jesus looks at the adulterous woman, when Jesus looks at that Samaritan woman at the well, he sees a child of God, created in God's image. He sees someone who is in need of love. And both of these women are experiencing great need in that moment where they meet Jesus. What Jesus does say again and again and again is love your neighbor as yourself. That is the second part of the greatest commandment. It, the first part is to love God. The second part is to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, there's a difference when we put people into categories. My neighbor is someone I know. My neighbor may or may not be someone I like. It's kind of funny uh, watching the Cresswell community Facebook page. It is amazing the things that people complain about on that Facebook page. In fact, one of our neighbors here in Cresswell wrote on there this quite uh, impressive tongue and cheek complaint. He said, I came home from work and there was someone else's squirrel <laughs> sitting on top of my fence. And I could tell by looking in my yard that one of the neighbor's cats had trespassed and left a paw print in my yard. And then there were these two unruly seniors who were walking down the street causing a great ruckus by laughing and enjoying each other's company. How dare they? It's sometimes hard to love our neighbors. It's sometimes hard to love ourselves. But Jesus is very clear that this is part of what it means to be the people of God, to love God and to love our neighbors. And when we look at our neighbors, when we see them, we should see them through the eyes of Jesus. The one who looks at all of us and sees a child of God, created in the image of God, 
one who is struggling just like everyone else, to be, just simply to be. You see, there's a problem with categorizing our neighbor as a sinner. Because in a way, it sets us up in the place of the Pharisee from Jesus' parable. I kind of feel bad sometimes for the Pharisees because, quite frankly, they end up being the bad example of what not to do in Jesus' stories all the time. But that Pharisee stands up and prays, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, other sinners. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, when looking at and giving an example of some of the worst of sinners, Thieves and adulterers. He mentions an IRS agent. (laughs) And yet that tax collector knows full well who he is and pleads for mercy. And forgiveness. And Jesus makes it very clear that the message is not just about knowing who you are and knowing that we are all sinners. The message is very clear. He says, Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So when we say, love the sinner, hate the sin, we've already put ourselves in the position of the Pharisee. Because we don't see them as a child of God, just as we are, sinner alike. We've labeled them, we've named them. And so, we turn to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge so that you may not be judged, for with the same judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you receive. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? Jesus is not arguing and saying that some are better than others. He's arguing and saying that those who point out specks in others' lives are blind to the logs in their own. This becomes a problem, this setting up of a relationship between our neighbors where we have all the answers and we do all the right things and they don't. This is a troublesome thing. In a way, it makes it hard for us, harder for us to truly love our neighbors as ourselves. Now the question becomes, to whom does this message get applied? Love the sinner, hate the sin. It's actually a fairly new theological concept. It's been there all along. We saw it with the Pharisee and the tax collector. That's exactly what the Pharisee is doing. He would say he loves the tax collector because he's told to love his neighbor. But boy, does he hate the sin of that sinner. So to whom do we apply this? 
Do we apply this to people who enjoy eating shrimp? Because the Bible is very clear about eating shellfish. Do we apply this to people who love bacon? The Bible is also very clear about eating a pig. It's an unclean animal. Do we apply this to people who eat, who, excuse me, to wear mixed clothing with polyester and cotton mixed in it? Maybe depending on the level of polyester they're wearing. <laughs> Do we apply this to women who come to church with their heads uncovered? Do we apply this to women who speak in worship? Do we say, love the sinner, hate the sin? Do we apply it to people who are divorced? That one, actually, we have come quite a long way on in a short amount of time, recognizing that life has circumstances. To whom do we apply this message? Love the sinner, hate the sin. My guess is I don't even have to tell you. My guess is you know where this is going. We apply this message, and I say we, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying we as Christianity in this culture applies this message of love the sinner and hate the sin to those who happen to love the wrong people. We apply it to them. We want to love them, but they're a sinner. And we hate their sin. The problem is with speck picking and logs in eyes. The problem is when we put ourselves in positions higher than others, we run the risk of becoming those who are exalted and who will one day be humbled. So the good news here is that there is a easier way than loving the sinner and hating the sin. It's a much easier way. It's the way of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. regardless of who they are, regardless of what they do, regardless of who they love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our affirmation of faith, which comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians and speaks of Jesus' humbling of himself for the purpose of our salvation. Let us affirm our faith together with these words. Christ Jesus though what was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God 
as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Go forth this morning loving your neighbor. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all God's people said,